and go. There was a blind man on the corner of a very busy city. This place he would beg at, it was passed by thousands of people every day. The city he lived in, it was huge. I'm sure there were some generous people that would tip him a few bucks every now and again. Fun fact. Top five biggest cities in the world in order are, according to citymayors.com, Tokyo in the 33 millions, New York, Sao Paulo in Brazil, Seoul in South Korea, and Mexico City on the 17 millions. Humans like to gather in large masses. We like to feel included. We like the support of one another. But when one is different, they're excluded. Why is this the case? When we feel like we have questions, or we are different, or we're at a loss, why is it that people exclude us? I'm not sure about you, but for me, I would have passed this man by without a second thought. When we see someone down on their road, it makes us think of us at our lowest. We become nervous, we become worried even, we become uncomfortable. When you're in a crowd, it's easy to follow along with everybody else. But when you're stuck begging, it makes you an undesirable. You can picture it, can't you? A man on the street corner, living broke, lost, looking for anything but simply cannot see. Does it make you feel uncomfortable? An image of the downtrodden human being needing some hope, some restoration, some grace. It does me. It makes me feel awkward, upset, uncomfortable, worried that I might become that. Why is it that when a large mass gathers, we have a bigger tendency to ignore? Well, what if I told you the one who held the moon, the sun, and the universe cared about this man? It's true because we read about it in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Verse 46. They came to Jericho. Side note. At this time, Jericho was a large city full of wealth. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. Probably making everyone feel uncomfortable, just trying to live and survive. Verse 47, when he heard it, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This is a man who wants to be noticed, wants to be cared about. He still has faith, he still has hope, he still has passion. But what does the crowd do? Verse 48, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. This is where things get really interesting. This, I believe, what most people would not have done unless they had immense amount of faith and hope. How do you think Jesus responds to this? Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, Call him. Already I'm going, wow. How could you not be excited about that? You're wanted by a man, singled out by a man who is already sought after by so many. Now some Bibles have a different word right here, but in the NIV this next sentence gets really up there. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, 
on your feet. He's calling you. Cheer up. Other Bibles use another word for this, tharseu, meaning I am of good courage, good cheer, I am bold. So this tells us that the blind man became sad after the crowd had rejected him, cast him to the side, and shut him down. Do we not do that to others too often? Verse 50, throwing his cloak aside, the cloak that he kept money on, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Verse 51 is where things start to get really astounding. The Lord that created all, who spoke everything into existence, asked a simple yet profound question, one that makes me ponder, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. At this moment, I'm thinking, you don't have a chance to ask for anything from God incarnate. And instead of riches or knowledge or the meaning of life or just to be sure he really is the Messiah in the flesh. But no, this, this man, he has so much faith that he asked for his sight back so he can start living again, making money again, being whole again. And Jesus recognizes this. He recognizes it, and he rewards it. In verse 52, Go, Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and follows Jesus along the road. He left everything behind and just went. He followed Jesus along the road. We read that the blind man followed Jesus, but if we are Christians, and I do know that most of us identify with that, we are Christ followers. Yet I know myself included that oftentimes we need to put stipulations on our relationship with Christ when we follow we feel there needs to be something there that's like, ah, I gotta, I gotta put a stipulation on that. Does that make sense to you? Now, don't get me wrong, but as Don Everett states in his book, Jesus with 30 Feet, we are Christ followers, or a more familiar term, disciples. And that means that although questions are not intrinsically wrong and in fact can make us grow stronger in the faith, we can sometimes have a tendency to get so wrapped up in theology that we forget who, what we really follow is about. In my own life, I've been struggling with a lot of big theological questions. I got to the point where I was so wrapped up in my understanding, in making sure everything was so logical, had to be perfect, I understand God, that I was blind to the word I so righteously devoted myself to studying. When I was in my teens, early high school, I had walked away from the faith and went into a life of addiction and blindness. I was confused about everything. I looked into all sorts of religions. I started with ancient Egyptian because I figured that if they had an empire lasting over a thousand years with a common religion, it couldn't be too, off, too far off, right? There had to be something there. So I started there. Then I went to a lot of other Eastern religions, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism. And after all the religions I had been researching, I gained two things. One, a lot of knowledge about religions. And two, that Wicca was a religion for me. I decided, let's go more Western, stay historical, but go more Western. I practiced some spells. 
that of course didn't work. But I see that after time, I came back to the faith and was able to see again. Huh. I was able to understand, even in my even in my Wiccan worldview, that these two opposing deities you have, you have a basically essentially a good god and a bad god. Positive and negative forces constantly all the time at equal power. I could not get it out of my mind that the evil God was Satan. I just couldn't. That, that upbringing, that Christian dynamic, whatever it was, that was, that was Satan in my mind. And no matter how I looked at it, that meant that this other God had to be God. That made sense to me. But if that's God, then that means, oh wait, what Jesus said in the scriptures are, must be true. Well, now that, that just brings me back to where I started. That confused me. If the scriptures and what Revelation say are true, then God wins. That means I was playing on the wrong team. Lord, I had to repent. I couldn't take it. I was going to be on the losing side. That's not okay. No matter how many spells you cast, you're still doing magic. I felt that doubt and confusion even through all of that, kind of melt away the moment I stood firm in my faith. I made it my own. Because I have started to feel like this again, even in my own faith now, it feels as if it would be easier sometimes to just slap a label on myself and call myself an atheist. But I know, I know that's not why I live. That's not who I am. That's not how I identify. That's not what I see. Like our good friend Bartimaeus, I have decided to remain hopeful and faithful in the understanding that I am called, cared about, and loved. At times, we may just need to have a bit of faith. Jesus was about communing with the undesirables, those who loved him, still is. But I've got a question for you. Are you? How do you live the faith that we claim to have to show, that we claim to serve? I would like to end by sharing a poem that I wrote. It builds, it builds. It builds. It only grows. It makes us think that our sorrows are other people's woes. We think we live the good life when condemning others tears our heart in strife. Like the sun, we think we shine above all. We are more than dull. As the universe is infinite, we say we are like the galaxies and the stars, thinking we aren't shoved inside jars. Presiding above another, that's our rightful place, is it not? We feel entitled because we fought. A soul ranked above others fights to keep its power, exerting influence, erasing its faults. To be better, better, better than its enemies, to realize it's just a coward. Even now we say we are not like this, then why do we feel each side to this coin? This coin, this dreadful coin. One must be the head, if not the tail. We f must flip it just to be happy. Meaning someone else must be beneath you. This plague that I fear, it comes closer, it comes near. It's not far in the distance. It will soon be upon us there. Don't you see it? Their figure in the dust. He's humanity's enemy. 
As the book says, the thief comes only to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. The father of lies is here. But to finish the scripture, there is hope. I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. The necessity, the need, the never-ending want to be above is a lie. We are conditioned. What is true success? It is not power. It's to give love. If one lives the life they so righteously condemn, they are no more right than the enemy. This elitism is not the way. Truth, love, and compassion are pure. We cannot judge while virtue is in the heart and so very near. We are no better. We can do no better. We all struggle. We are all special. We all have needs. We all need compassion. Without this coin, we can love. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time that we get to be together. Thank you for your words in our lives, what you did, what you continue to do for us daily. Thank you for the faith, for the hope that you give us. We praise you and we thank you for you have all the power in this world. Don't ever let us doubt that. In your holy name.